This master class is about one of uh, the great problems in the future of our science and technology. And so I think very much, very much in the future of science and technology here in Israel, where there is such a vibrant environment. Um, the problem of intelligence is, I think, not only one of the great problems in science and technology, I think he's the greatest one. Um, uh, I apologize to the physicists and the chemists and the astrophysicists and the biologists, but I think that um, if we could uh, make progress in understanding intelligence, even some progress, then we could find ways to make ourselves smarter and to make smart computers that would help us think. And so then we'll be able to solve more easily all other problems in science. In other words, the brain is the very tool we use to understand everything else. So it's critically important to understand how this works and if possible to replicate parts of it in machines. Um, the idea that I, I want to tell you today is that we have to look at the brain for building smarter computers. And let me start observing that we are making a lot of progress already in uh, many in the last 15 years in making machines that are as intelligent as we are in narrow domains of intelligence. For instance, um, computers are better than us in playing chess. This is Deep Blue and Kasparov. This was more than 10 years ago. And there is no librarian that can beat Googles, that can find almost anything and immediately has changed the way scientists uh, look at papers and do research, at least the way I do it. Um, there is Kinect of Microsoft recognizing human gesture from vision. There is Watson winning a jeopardy against human champions. That involves not only a lot of knowledge, but natural language. And of course, there is Siri um, on the iPhone, which is not yet my ideal secretary, but I hope will be in five years when finally will understand my accent. It does not yet <laughs> do it. Um, and there are, of course, um, pilotless drones that can land on aircraft carrier, something that is probably the, one of the most difficult feats for a pilot to do. So um, we have machines that um, are also starting to perceive the world the way we do. And here I just use a couple of old examples from, from work in my groups about uh, uh, 15 years ago or so about detecting faces in images. Um, and, uh, um, you know, this is now in all digital cameras. So 15, 10 years after um, our group and others did work for face detection, then uh, commercial applications. Um, happened and um, and another problem we did also quite some time ago was detecting people and um, and this was an, um, an old system that we tested with Daimler in a Mercedes in Ulm to detect, to detect pedestrians in the from the camera in the car and to warn the driver of possible risk um, it did a, probably a mistake every few seconds, but now um, there is a company here in Jerusalem uh, of a, a co-worker of mine and um, student and postdoc, Amnon Shashua, um, who has been developing a system to do that thing, that task, detecting people and several other ones. And the system is now in various uh, uh, high-end cars like BMW and Volvo and so on, um, detecting cars, detecting people like human drivers do. And um, in fact, this is um, um, a um, advertisement of one of the first car with that system. 
uh, the Volvo S60, which you can buy. Um, which I'll show it because it's uh, interesting. This is not just uh, systems uh, for uh, entertainment. They are doing actually something very useful. This is a, a division system in the car and um, the Volvo. There was a nice music which I don't have. <laughs> so, you know, these systems are pretty good, can be quite useful, they will change our life, but, uh, uh, but, but we don't have, as yet, machines that can um, think or perceive the way we do. Um, there is no machine that can be um, such to pass right now a real Turing test, confuse a human in believing that the machine is really a human. Um, and so my bet is that we've if we want to make this step of developing machines that are as intelligent as we are, or as human as we are, then we need to uh, have another cycle of basic research in understanding how our brain and our intelligence works. Uh, look, for instance, at um, vision. In, uh, for us, vision is not only answering the question of what is this? You know, that's a hat, it's a fork, it's a plate, it's a face. But it's also, and this is what uh, a vision machine is starting to do, but it's also answering question about human activities, um, actions, about the relations. Um, so it's, uh, you can imagine, you can ask if uh, almost an infinite number of questions about a single image and people can answer those very easily. There is no computer and we don't know as yet how to build one that could answer all this kind of, this almost infinite kind of, uh, list of possible questions. So, um, how are we going to solve this problem? Well, the only computer so far that can answer all these questions is uh, a part of the brain called uh, um, visual cortex, ventral stream, is the part of the visual cortex which is involved in object recognition. The human brain, there are about um, uh, 100 billion or so of neurons. They are cells with many, many contacts between them, um, about 1,000 or 10,000 contacts per neuron, that's an interesting difference with respect to digital computers where the basic elements, logical gates or transistors, are typically three or four or five connections to other elements. Here is more like 1,000 and 10,000. Um, in uh, um, just to show you what can be done by trying to understand how a piece of this part of cortex works. Um, I'll speak briefly about some work in, 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 in my group in which we looked at um, a sequence of visual areas in this ventral cortex that comprises about one billion neurons in uh, the macaque monkey. Uh, it's a series of areas in cortex um, and we have simulated the connectivity and the properties of neurons between, um, within and between these different areas. And it's a very core simulation, is, uh, um, but is in the same line as several other models that have been developed over the last 10 years of this part of visual cortex. Um, there are some people here, like Shimon Ullman, who has contributed to some of this work. And this last model we have is probably uh, is just one example of this broader class of so-called feed-forward feed model of 
the ventral stream. Um, but interestingly, it can solve uh, some problems like this one. You have to say whether in each one of these images there is or there is not an animal. We have never seen before these images. I'll show it again. So it's called the rapid categorization task introduced by um, Simon Thorpe. And the task is actually relatively um, easy for humans to do. Humans on that kind of database are 80% correct in this binary task, an animal yes, an animal no. And um, surprisingly, our model that was based on data from anatomy and physiology uh, on the monkey, physiology meaning um, recordings from single neurons, kind of a fishing expedition among these billion neurons recording from single neurons and over the last two decades building um, a rough map of what's going on. So our model was really developed on um, uh, taking into account the data about the anatomy and the connectivity and the physiology on the monkey and surprisingly is capable of reproducing uh, the performance, the human level performance and also some of the same mistakes that humans do on these images. So the images in this task that are difficult for the model are also difficult for humans and vice versa. Now, this does not say that the model is correct. And there is, uh, uh, even if it's correct, it's, it's only a little bit of the full story of what uh, human vision of the macaque vision is doing. But it gives some hope that um, 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 we can, um, by understanding the brain, uh, uh, actually have computers reproduce human performance, human perceptions. Um, the, same, the same model has been used in a system which is um, now um, in a biologist's lab to quantify the behavior of mutant mice, that are, which are used as models for mental diseases like autism or schizophrenia or so on. It's a kind of ironic that um, we have a very quantitative, um, a very quantitative um, knowledge of the, the genome of these um, animals um, and it's cheap to get and faster, uh, but we don't have a very quantitative measurements of their behavior. So this system classifies micro behaviors of the mouse and then you can do statistics and other things and so you can finally connect uh, genotype to phenotype. That's uh, potentially a gold mine for genomics. Um, but this is just, again, a, a slight irony that a model that is coming from the neuroscience of the brain is actually helping biologists try to find out more about the genetic um, reasons for mental diseases. So um, my, my little story is, is really that we have at least one example in which we can copy a small part of the brain, implement it in machines, and get results uh, at least as good as engineers have been able to get. And in the near future, maybe better, perhaps. Um, so this is promising for the idea that I was telling you that we can and should look at the brain for building smarter computers and for understanding the brain itself, which at the end is really understanding ourselves and probably, perhaps, uh, hopefully, being able to understand how to improve our decision-making and also improve not only individual intelligence, but how collection of minds can take more intelligence decisions. So, um, let me finish here and open, open the, the, the ground to you for questions. I'll be happy to answer anything you want to ask about what I said or related topics. Thank you.
think, okay. can you hear me? Yes. Okay. If, if computers uh, do get better than human vision, uh, what are the limits that you see in the future? Because maybe we can eventually replace our vision with a camera and a, and a computer. Yes. Um, I think, uh, you know, it's always difficult to make uh, predictions, even about the present, and, and so much more about the future. But um, I think uh, um, there is no reason why, why we, we could not improve uh, our senses at some point in the future. It's, as a, you know, predicting when, it's always very difficult. Um, it may it may take uh, uh, much longer than uh, one would think just because of uh, the problem of interfacing um, you know brain cells with electronics in a way that is not too invasive but we can already in terms of uh, um, you know if you think about the matrix the movie so there, there is this virtual reality which is created by reading from the brain and writing into the brain. And we have demonstrations with monkeys that we can do this to some very rough extent. We can bias by injecting currents in a visual cortex, in specific area of visual cortex, we can bias the perception of objects like faces and um, conversely, we can, and that's actually easier, read out directly from the neural activity of neurons in visual cortex, say of the monkey, what the monkey is looking at, again, within certain limits. And this can be done in humans to um, not so well, but uh, um, we're using fMRI, for instance, or MEG. We have recently some results in my group, MEGs, magnetoencephalography, um, in which you record electrical activity through uh, superconducting um, sensors that um, measure the variation of magnetic fields due to currents in the neurons, and you can see, again, from the, this activity, you can decide what the person has been looking at without looking at the image, just the brain activity. So we can do this, it's just, it may take a very long time to do it to a degree which is usable and to a degree in which it can be used without having to insert electrodes through your, your skull. Nobody wants really to do that. Um, but I think, uh, you know, given enough time, it will be possible. And uh, whether one can, you know, speculate, science fiction, uh, is this um, the beginning of a new species? Uh, maybe. Thank you. Uh, okay. Hello, uh, I'm, uh, I'd like to ask you a question that's related to how far do you think we can go in understanding human intelligence? Now, human intelligence includes not just, <coughs> uh, not just thought processes, but also it, 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 its actions. And uh, from the time, and until I think that we can have machines that can perform way humans do, like in the sense that, I mean, Turing test is all right, but I'd go on a Turing test for a machine that would, I would like to go out with an old hand with. <laughs> that I would like to, uh, and until we have something like that, I don't know, uh, you know, uh, how far can we go? And, uh, I, I, it, it seems to me that many people in your field talk as if human beings can be, rep, you know, replicated. 
I don't think this is possible, and I'd like to know what you think about this. Um, well, yeah. Um, you know, maybe nobody wants to replicate human beings. There are better ways to do it, which are more fun. But, <laughs> but um, you know, I think I addressed at, at first the, uh, the, this uh, topic of uh, actual machines that can um, act and operate in the environment as we do, moving around and uh, grasping things and and so on. And um, you know, I did not speak at all about robotics, but robotics is a field which is developing rapidly. Um, uh, it took quite some time, but if you look, for instance, at the last uh, challenge issued by DARPA, which is the Defense Research Agency in the US, uh, was about um, building a robot that probably has to be humanoid-like, um, because the task is to be able to drive a car for this robot and go to a, say, a plant. What, what they had in mind is the Fukushima accident. So you have to have a robot which can go into the car, get to a car, drive it to a plant, and then being able to open a door there and bring some heavy equipment inside. Now, um, that's a very difficult, ambitious task, and I don't think it will be done when, uh, I think the challenge is for about one or two years, two years from now. I don't think this will be possible, but, you know, give it uh, maybe five years, I think, uh, or less, and uh, uh, this, this will probably be done. So there will be robots that will be um, maybe not, completely similar to us. There is uh, uh, no need to replicate something that works pretty well, but, um, but uh, it will be, it will be quite, uh, quite impressive. Let's see. You have been waiting for a long time. <laughs> No, uh, no. It, it does work. no, it works. Okay. Uh, well, uh, as, as a physicist, I cannot, I cannot avoid uh, uh, noticing that the methods you mention, like fMRI and yeah. so on, give us a very global information only. There are serious limitations in time resolution and in space resolution. Yeah. So my feeling is that that uh, uh, a lot of the optimism we hear in the field is more or less guessing, unless we really, unless we really get down to the individuals, we really cannot tell what, what is going on. Isn't that correct? Well, um, yes and no. <laughs> um, first of all, I, I think that will not solve the brain in the next 10 years. I mean, you know, humanity, mankind, philosophers has been thinking about the mind for 2,000 years or more, it would be kind of uh, 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 irrational to imagine that we can solve the problem. What does it mean, solve a problem completely, you know, in, in a short um, span of time? I, it will take much longer, but I think we can make significant and interesting progress in the next few years. Um, my, my guess is that, uh, you know, we're making progress now, um, um, we, there are certainly um, interesting, useful, important um, uh, fallouts from research in neuroscience, especially for, for uh, um, health in the sense of curing or correcting or doing something about diseases, mental diseases, and this will probably involve more um, neurobiology, molecular neurobiology. Um, but I think we are beginning to see that, that we know enough about the brain just now 
to begin to understand some of the strategies, the algorithms that the brain is, is using to solve problems. That's what I call the mind, the software of the brain, if you want. Um, that's a more difficult task, as, as I said, will take longer, but um, even small progresses here will have quite a big impact. Uh, for instance, I get, and that's a bet I'm making on artificial intelligence. Um, and as I said, I, I don't think you need to solve the full problem um, in order to have an impact. What do you think about uh, neuroscience research being used for uh, marketing purposes, neuromarketing? <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> yeah, there is a... Uh, there are people interested in this, and uh, um, the, the question I have is not about, um, so for instance, using fMRI to see um, the reaction of the brain of people for different products and so on. What is not clear to me in many of these cases is whether you really need to go through the brain or whether you could more easily um, know what the person is feeling by asking the person. So the old technique. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah. So th there is the possibility that, um, you're right, that our, we are not completely conscious of what we are doing. Absolutely. And that's probably correct. That's actually kind of, of interesting. There is evidence that... Um, you know, it's kind of left and right brain situation, which uh, that people do things um, before being consciously aware of doing them or deciding to do it. Um, so this would speak in favor of looking at more, more com completely to brain activity and not just have, say, questions, questionnaire, to people. Um, we'll see. I think there is not an, enough evidence to say that, um, you know, this uh, fMRI or EEG techniques can tell us more than standard, standard polls. Uh, Ray Kurzweil talks about enhancing the brain in the future, and uh, it's not so much in the future anymore. I just read about uh, implants in the brain for epilepsy to try to control seizures and that it helps the individual to focus their intellect. So I'm wondering, what is the future of this and would you consider that to be part of artificial intelligence? Um, well, the, this um, um, ways to uh, implants to control epilepsy or uh, a very successful one is uh, to control Parkinson is uh, uh, deep um, brain stimulations, is continuous currents that um, I don't think uh, neuroscientists know quite as yet why, but works pretty well in uh, controlling Parkinson in some, several people. And there are quite a, a few people with implants of this type. This is certainly neuroscience. I'm not sure it's artificial intelligence. Probably not, because I don't think those things by the themselves will um, are telling us too much about how the brain works, how the mind works, how intelligence, what intelligence is. But um, of course, what Ray Kurzweil wants to do is uh, is artificial intelligence and neuroscience is this combination of the two. Um, I I know Ray quite well, and uh, I'm not as optimistic as he is in terms of the timing <laughs> of this, but uh, you know, ultimately, I agree with him in a number of on a number of things. When you talk about intelligence and the the tasks, vision, being able to pick objects up, and so when we think of intelligence. To me, it, it also includes a kind of emotional intelligence. And when you talk about passing a broader Turing test, does that take place just in the brain? Do we need to recreate an endocrine system or something else in our, in our computers? Or, or can you say something about 
the other parts of human intelligence? Um, well, there is certainly, uh, that's a good point. I, I think we have been, at least I certainly have underestimated the importance of social intelligence in uh, what we call intelligence. You know, um, just as a parenthetical remark, the Turing test is really a test not of intelligence, but of human intelligence, because um, it, suppose you have a computer that is much more intelligent, different way than we are, um, you know, it will, a person who could detect this to be different from humans will not pass the Turing test. <laughs> so, um, but also it's pretty um, um, important also for probably evolution of our species. Um, the, the social part of our intelligence, the way we um, recognize people, recognize um, what they plan to do. This is what is called, in, it's a term which is somewhat strange, theory of mind, you know, putting yourself in the shoes of somebody else. And, um, um, and if you believe some recent thoughts about why Homo sapiens has been so successful, um, you can make a story that there is really the social part of our intelligence is the fact that that we were able to communicate, to trust each other, and to trade. And therefore, we did not need to uh, learn uh, how to fish and how to kill a lion, but one person could uh, learn and be good at one task, another at another, and then sharing sharing the fruits of this by, by trade, therefore by uh, social communication, um, we are as a society really a super brain that have uh, built upon the strength of each one of us. So anyway, um, there, are, there is more research now in finding the parts of the brain and the modules in the brain that are involved in this social aspects of intelligence. And this is something that is really kind of starting and exploding right now. So there will be much more to come into the future. I think the, you know, the, the modulator of neural activity, um, chemical modulators, uh, including the endocrine system are kind of necessary, but there is much more to it than just than just the, the key is who, who is modulating the chemical that modulate the other neurons. And it's a whole system. The brain itself is not just electronic. It's a chemo electrical computer, if you want. So it's difficult to distinguish or separate the chemical part from the rest. understand that the MIT is one of the centers of uh, system thinking, which means everything is connected to everything. Mm -hmm. I would like to hear from you how we can connect the Israeli neuroscience research to the MIT or other research centers and create a super network <laughs> of uh, brain research. Well, um, you know, I, I think uh, both the artificial intelligence and neuroscience in Israel is very good, and there are very strong ties with, uh, um, with other institutions in Europe and in the US, including MIT. Several of my friends in Israel are coming often to see me and others uh, at MIT that are collaborating and, uh, you know, I started this, uh, this class today saying that this problem of the brain intelligence is important also for Israel. And what I was thinking is important in the sense that Israel has to, can, and I'm sure will, play a big role in solving important part of it. So, you know, things can always be improved, but I think they're rather good already. So some, some has been touched on, um, but uh, I'm wondering, beyond the dealing with the Parkinson's disease and disease, uh, different things along these lines, as somebody that is looking at a generation 
through the eyes of hope and possibilities and all the things that are out there of dynamicness, what opportunity is there to be able to actually somewhat implant in your own terms language? I don't know how many people in this room speak Hebrew and English, but a lot of people don't. And so to be able to bring almost like the Tower of Babel, to be able to bring everybody together to be able to be on the same page, where we can understand Arabic, where we can understand Spanish, where we can understand Turkish, so on and so forth, to be able to speak the language that's endearing to people. How do we get there in such a way, in such a mechanism that uh, in the best of ways now, rather than 20 years from now, or 10 years from now, whatever the case may be, not just implanting, but maybe a mechanism that you've thought of along the way to be able to advance ourselves so that we don't have so much of the distractions but rather the focus factors to be able to make it come into fruition. Yeah, um, that's an interesting question. I think, um, you know, this is a case where uh, we'll probably have um, little machines or apps or so that will uh, translate for us speech. This is starting to happen. Um, I think direct brain implants, that's what, what you were uh, addressing to, this will take a much longer time. Um, I don't think it's impossible. Uh, I think it will happen, but I think you will have, uh, you know, your iPhone or Android phone or uh, translate uh, for you from uh, Hebrew to Arabic or English and, and vice versa. This, uh, as I said, will it's starting to happen, will be probably be usable in uh, less than five years. It's, uh, um, I, I think, will be really working in a few more years. But I think uh, we are probably due to stop here. I want to thank everybody, and you know, I'll be around here if you want to check.